Have you ever heard anybody say everyone has a little bit of autism or use terms like low or high functioning autism? Like how low functioning autistic people have more autism? Let's talk about what the autism spectrum actually is and why it's impossible to have a little bit of autism. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm autistic and ADHD and welcome to my channel where we learn about neurodivergence. When people think about the autism spectrum, they think about something like this. Basically a linear graph of people having more or less autism. There are people that do think that everyone has autism and people that are diagnosed with autism just have more of it. You might even hear people say things like a touch of autism in an unironic way. This is what terms like low and high functioning come across as. Let me put it this way. We have autistic person number one and autistic person number two. Autistic person number one can make eye contact sometimes, sometimes understands body language, sometimes can understand jokes and sarcasm, is hyperverbal and talks a lot, doesn't have many public meltdowns or shutdowns, doesn't stim around other people, is a straight A student, and has friends and romantic relationships. You can assume this person doesn't look or seem very autistic. They are neurotypical passing and are therefore labeled as high functioning. Autistic person number two often can't go to stores alone, often can't tolerate being touched, often forgets to shower and eat, cannot hear people speaking if there's distracting noise, gets disoriented with sensory overload, like in stores, school, or even walking down the street, can't maintain focus enough to do simple tasks like homework or watching a show, goes non-speaking for random periods of time, and flunks any class when an unexpected change occurs. Like if a teacher is out sick, you can assume this person will most likely never function independently and struggle to complete college or maintain a job. They appear to have low functioning autism. But here's the plot twist. Both of these people are me. <gasps> Autistic people labeled as high functioning are expected to mask and present themselves a certain way, which can lead to loss in identity and increased meltdowns later in life. People labeled as low functioning are confined into a box which prevents their incredible abilities and capabilities from being seen and appreciated. Society simply tells us whether the way we display our autism is acceptable to them or not, and that's not okay. Autistic brains are completely different than allistic brains. If you haven't heard the term allistic before, allistic means not autistic. Neurotypical means not neurodivergent. It is impossible to have a little bit of autism and all autistic people have the same amount of autism. The spectrum actually looks like this, a pie chart with many different autistic traits. A lot of pie charts are organized differently, but they tend to include things like social differences or difficulties, special interests or hyperfixations, stimming or repetitive behavior, sensory issues and sensitivities, emotional regulation, which is basically the ability to respond to demands or experience a range of emotions, Perception like seeing with meaning. An example would be like an autistic person is looking at the trees but not at the forest. Executive functioning like time management, organizational abilities, and critical thinking. And motor difficulties like delay with movement, posture, or coordination. Every autistic person is different. So each pie chart is different for individual autistic people. The more the pie slice is filled, the more the individual struggles with that specific trait. Some slices may be entirely filled and some may be empty. We all display our traits and characteristics differently, which is why terms like low and high functioning are actually harmful and inaccurate. A saying doctors like to use is if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. But if an autistic person states that they would like to have a functioning label that is their own personal choice and you should respect that. And just a heads up, telling an autistic person that they're high functioning is not a compliment. It can be pretty insulting and feel like you're disqualifying all of our struggles. Terms like low or high support needs or low or high masking are better alternatives. And these labels aren't constant either. Some days I may be high masking and some days I may be low masking. Our masks and support needs are constantly changing. No two autistic people are the same and that's why it's called a spectrum. If you want to see what your pie chart looks like, you can go to idrlabs.com. This is what my pie chart looks like. Saying everyone has a little bit of autism is harmful and undermines the difficulties and challenges autistic people face every day. We require support, accommodations, and understanding from our family, peers, and community to navigate the environment and reach our best potential. It's important to recognize and support autistic individuals based on our unique strengths rather than minimizing our experiences and struggles with harmful and accurate language. Now let's go over what's going on in the brain. So autism is a neurodevelopmental disability. There are a few brain regions that are commonly found to be different in autistic brains versus allistic brains. Notice I'm saying commonly, not always, because there isn't a singular pattern or structure that is the same in every autistic person. Starting off with the hippocampus, 
The hippocampus is a part of the brain that forms and stores memories. Autistic children and adolescents tend to have an enlarged hippocampus. It was also found that some children who were later diagnosed with autism had excess cerebrospinal fluid, which is a liquid that surrounds the brain and it may contribute to having an enlarged head. The fluid can appear in as early as six months old and can persist through age three. This was really interesting to read because my sister's autistic and she had a really big head when she was a baby to the point where they thought that she had megalencephaly, but eventually she just grew into her head. It was also found that autistic people have a surplus of synapses in the brain, and this excess is due to a slowdown in a normal brain pruning process during development. Neuroscience is hard, so let's break it down. So a brain can have around 100 billion neurons. Neurons are information centers. If we were to zoom in on one, it looks like this. A neuron is a nerve cell that sends and receives signals. Neurons use chemical and electrical signals to communicate between the brain, spinal cord, and the entire body. A synapse is a small pocket of space between two neurons where they pass messages and communicate. This is what a neuron looks like up close. And this is where a synapse is. Pruning or synaptic pruning is a natural process that occurs in the brain as you grow and develop. During this synaptic pruning, your brain gets rid of extra synapses. So children are going to have more synapses than adults. By adulthood, allistic brains pruned about 50% of their extra synapses, whereas autistic brains only pruned 16%. Basically, autistic people have a lot more synapses than allistic people. Scientists found that this pruning defect is caused by a protein called MTOR. When the MTOR is overactive, the brain loses a lot of its self-eating or pruning ability. So a lot of this is actually going on in the amygdala. The amygdala determines how we act in a crisis depending on the stimuli it receives. It's thought to be the core of the neural system for processing fear and threatening stimuli. It also processes and consolidates memory. It was found that the neurons in the amygdala of autistic children have excess dendritic spines, which are these protrusions that link up with other neurons. Because of this, researchers found that the amygdala in autistic children is hyperconnected. Autistic brains showed increased spine density on various areas of the brain, like the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes, and lateral nucleus of the amygdala. So not only are there extra neurons and synapses in autistic brains, but there are excess dendritic spines too. Neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to learn and change over time. Dendritic spines are very plastic, so their size and shape is constantly changing according to neuronal activity. Learning and memory formation is tightly linked to the remodeling or elimination of existing dendritic spines and formation of new ones. So basically, dendritic spines are sites for memory formation and storage. There are six different types of dendritic spines. We're going to be going over four of them. Mushroom spines have the longest lifetime and are thought to be the sites for long-term memory storage. Thin spines have a smaller head than mushroom spines. They're more dynamic and thought to be learning spines. Stubby spines are stubby and don't have a neck. They're the main neuron when you're a baby and a young child. But we do have a small amount of them in adulthood. Philopodia are long, thin, and don't have a visible head. They're observed in developing neurons. Studies show that in autistic brains, there's a higher frequency of immature spines like philopodia. But I know what you're wondering, what does all of this do exactly? So remember how autistic brains only prune 16% of their synapses? We have a lot of extra neurons, synapses, and dendritic spines. And a lot of our dendritic spines never got remodeled, so they aren't really helping us in any way. I like to think of it like this. Let's say you have to get from point A to point B. In one scenario, there are two or three extra people in the room that aren't really blocking you from getting to your destination. This is an allistic brain. In a different scenario, you have a giant crowd blocking you from getting to your destination, and you might even have a few people whispering wrong directions to you. It'll take you longer to get from point A to point B. So it's thought with a bunch of extra synapses, neurons, and dendritic spines, it's going to take a lot longer to process information because there's a lot going on and there's a lot to process. So autistic people may need more time to process their environment and process information in comparison to allistic brains. The large amount of dendritic spines and synapses we have could also lead to heightened sensitivity to sensory input, as well as impaired social communication and interaction, and repetitive behaviors, which are key traits in autism. But the main thing is sensory processing differences. This also contributes to autistic strengths like attention to detail, pattern recognition, and organizing information. Remember that all autistic people are different. We are people. We deserve respect and patience. Happy Autism Acceptance Month. Make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the little bell for notifications. Bye!